So just announcing the ETSA Investment Society, if you're not aware of them, it's a professional organization that's had great success in getting our students jobs. So it has quite the incredible network. Um, I still remember going to New York. I probably told you all this story before, but going to New York and I meet with Dee, who was one of our original Investment Society members. She's high ranking at Citibank, moving up fast. So I have lunch with her and say, oh, one of my students is interning here. She's, so she looks him up, calls him, he comes over for lunch. She goes back with him, introduces him to all kinds of people all over his place. So yeah, that's a good network. And that's how the Event Society does that great, creates an incredible network. The goal is, you know, for me, it's comprehension, retention, and application. So the goal of the Investment Society is application. Take what you've done in class and build a model. You're trying to get your portfolio built on LinkedIn. I don't know what's in your portfolio right now. You should have papers. The papers in this class will work really, really well. You need to build some models. The Investor Society builds models like stock screening models. I, I mentioned, I'm going to show you again, my uh, my dashboard I like to use. Build a dashboard. There's all kinds of things you can build that you can put out there on LinkedIn. So you want to have stuff out there on LinkedIn that you can actually show them. Papers are the best because a lot of schools have stopped papers entirely because there's a lot of lazy professors who don't like grading papers. And so what did I do? They do group projects. So why did I do group projects? They say it's to help, help you learn how to work together as a team, but that's a complete lie. I, I was at a conference where once when a professor says, yeah, I do group projects because I'm not going to grade all this stuff. So, you know, group projects cuts their workload, you know, one sixth or 90% and they, they love it. So, there were, you know, students complain I require papers, but you're going to be glad you have a paper to put out there on LinkedIn to show that you can write a paper, a professional paper, and know how to do research. So the Invest Society helps you with that. We have a lot of classes. We show you how to, you know, a good example is Cap IQ has a really good investment banking valuation model. Invest Society show you how to use that. It's real simple. You bring it in. You can see how they do it. I use it in my security analysis class. So you're trying to get out of the classroom and stop looking like a student and start looking like a professional that you're doing stuff. So that's what the Invest Society does. So we'll start Wednesday night, 745. Just go to the second floor and look for our sign. Larissa's in there. Uh, Alyssa, are you even in there? Who else? There's a few others in here. Oh, Sebastian and Nathaniel. So, you know, talk to them or just show up. If you're not sure, just show up and just see what the talk is about. There are other student organizations. So if you're in another student organization, if it's a professional one, if it's purely social, um, not so much, but in you have meetings, I was the faculty sponsor for the Professional Women Society of UTSA because they couldn't find a, a female professor. And so that one's still near and dear to my heart. They fired me and hired someone else because they found someone. But that's a great group. Anyone in that group in here? Not when you are, so you let us know when we have meetings and we'll announce that. So Alexa is in that. So yeah, it's there's others, other groups out there. I'm sure that the Economist group is out there if anyone's involved in that. The Actual Societies have a group. The real estate people, Andrew, do you all have a team? Uh, the real estate. Real estate, yeah. So if y'all have meetings, let us know. So it's becoming more important. They want to see not that you're in a group, but that you're active in a group. So an officer profession is the best. The Invest Society helps by giving you other things that you can do to get more stuff on your resume. So, you know, you're, you don't build your resume in Word, you build your resume outside of class where you're doing stuff that they're interested in. So the Investment Society gives you real easy ways to get meaningful things on your resume without spending 40 hours a week. So, you know, it really, really helps to do that kind of thing. All right, before we do major asset classes, so I graded your team question last time and y'all did okay until you got the bonds and then it was not good at all. So you're not comfortable with bonds yet. Some of you turned in the wrong team member because no team got a one on what they put the stars on, but some team members did get a one. So some got full credit, but not the one you marked. So y'all missed. There was like three people who got full credit. But here's the bond market today. So what is the bond market doing today? So there's three things you have to talk about. Prices. What do the prices do today? Did they go up or go down? Is that significant or not significant? So it's, what is it in basis points? 6.9. What do we say was one standard deviation? 6.5. 6 so it's, it's, it's a decent day. So bond prices went up. 
Would you say significant? Significant may be a stretch, but it's it's a meaningful rise in bond prices. Yields fell 6.9 basis to close at 4.09. Several of y'all use this percent right here. How often are you going to quote the 1.66 percent? Never. It's a meaningless number. It shouldn't even be there. Right. Some of y'all are saying bonds moved 37 percent. No, bonds did not. If bonds moved 37 percent. That would have been a history. I don't think bonds have ever moved 37% in one day in price. The yield can move that much, but we don't talk about yields. The yield moved 6.9 basis points, all right? Never use that 1.66%, all right? Pretty good day. The market hit another record. We're getting close to that 5,000, which is not all that massive, you know, another 5%. So we're not that far away from 5%. NASDAQ got another big day. Small cap finally had a big day, but they're still dragging Oil is kind of moving around. Gold recently it hit a record high. I don't remember what it was, so I don't think it is today. So, you know, it's been an interesting few weeks. And then again, on the dashboard, I encourage you to create a dashboard and find someone up here, maybe in this class, and say, hey, let's meet every Monday at three o'clock and let's run our dashboard and let's just talk about it for 10 minutes. If you did that, you'll be so prepared for interviews. So as we can see, the last week, the market, the stock market's up 1.6, but you can see small cap, we're actually down slightly. Why are small cap just not able to get into the game here? Growth stocks are doing well, value stocks are doing okay, but growth is still dominating. You saw that today with the NASDAQ up so much, tech stocks and growth stocks are up a bunch. Nikkei was down, but Nikkei is still up significantly the last 12 months. Developed markets, emerging markets had a good week. In line with the U.S., emerging's up, but year to date, emerging's down a bunch. Why? It's China, isn't it? China's really struggling right now. Um, India's doing well. China's struggling. So that's the kind of you, you see. I'm just talking about it, and you, if you do that every week, a week, eventually you're going to have a story to tell. You're not going to stop and memorize. You know, you don't want to get to the point where you're memorizing stuff for for an interview. You just want to know it because you're talking about it every day or every week. So I would encourage you 20, well, maybe it's 15 minutes a week because it's taking me some time, 15 minutes a week, do a dashboard and just find someone to talk about. If you talk about it out loud, it's going to go into your permanent memory and you'll get it. Down here, I have the industries. Energy's up this past week because it looked like oil prices were up a good amount. Um, tech stocks up significantly year to date, significantly last 12 months. Consumer services, again, that's Facebook, in Google, um, you see the most interest rate sensitive sectors, utilities and real estate are down this year. That kind of makes sense. So you have a fairly consistent story here. The part of my dashboard I need to work on because I haven't had time to really work on it, those interest rates. So if you look at the 10 year treasury yield, it was up a basis point this last week. So it didn't move much. Year to date is up 29 basis points. That's a pretty significant move. That's why utilities are down and real estate are down. Last 12 months, the 10-year treasury is up 67 base points. That's a pretty hefty rise. And then spreads. We'll talk about spreads, so we'll have to get into this later. You notice it's a it's last Friday. It's not today. So that's 6.9 basis points to treasury today. I don't have that. I'm one day off. Why? Because spreads are, are kind of slow reporting. So we'll talk about spreads and get into what's going on with spreads. But um, so you, you definitely want all the major stock markets. You want the sectors probably. You want something on interest rates. Maybe you, you have gold. Maybe you have oil. Those kind of things. I had oil and gold in mind. Whatever else you might do, you might. One thing that is pretty interesting that you can do is get what stock, what, what are the 10 highest Returning stocks this year, what are the 10 lowest returning? If you do that at the S&P 500, they're larger companies. If you do the entire U.S., you can get some itty bitty bitty stocks that might be up 90 percent. Like penny stocks, I don't know if you've heard of penny stocks, we'll talk about them. But if you have a stock that's trading for one buck because they're about to go out of business and they go at $1.90, yeah, they're up 90 percent, but it's not that big of a deal because they're probably about to go under. So you have to decide what you put in your dashboard, but if you want this spreadsheet, you could at least start with this and you can just edit it for your own, your own numbers. So, so get into the habit of talking markets. All right. So last class we talked, 
what's an investment portfolio and the three questions. So Wednesday, we'll have our team question, no notes off the top of your head and talk about it. And then if we have a volunteer to actually say it to the class, that'd be the best that so you can think about it. So what would that be? Essentially, it's, it's an interview question which is a pretty common interview question. I just received $500,000. What would you recommend I do? And you would say, oh, $500,000. So you want to build an investment portfolio, a collection of assets, securities. So you're doing that for some future purpose. So to help you, I got to ask you three questions. What might those be? Well, first, why are you investing? Is this for retirement, to buy a house? Because we want to understand what you're investing for and see what drives that so we can understand what to invest in. And the most important thing there is, your horizon, do you need the money next week or in 20 years? Second thing is what can you invest in? Most, most people have a, a list of 10 to 15 asset classes they can use. We don't wanna have 50, that's too many. We don't wanna have three because we don't wanna be explained risk and get you diversified. But we gotta understand what asset classes you can go into. Are you comfortable with going international stocks? What about emerging countries? Are you comfortable with small US companies? Are you uncomfortable with high yield bonds? That's the kind of thing we're looking at. And the last question is, once we decide all that, we get to the how. What's going to be your strategic allocation? Do you want to be tactical? Do you want to try to beat the market? So that's essentially what we're going to be doing for Wednesday, that first part of that question. All right. How many can y'all do that on top of your head? Y'all getting there? It sounds, you know, to me, it's kind of second nature. Now, if I did this all again, I would say all different words. But I would say the same stuff, but there's not one way of saying it, but yeah, I might change the ordering around, but that's essentially what we're after. So now we get to the second question. What was the second question? What? what and why can you invest? So then we're going to spend a lot of time on the what. We're going to start high level with the four major asset classes. And I think these are the four major, uh, the one exception we got a few real estate people in here. The one exception is some people will break real estate as a separate class out and have five sections. I'm going to put real estate in with alternatives, but it just depends on a USA real estate was a separate class. We didn't have it as part of alternatives. Then we had a $3 billion portfolio. So it was a major part of our, our, our investment portfolio. So the four classes are, anybody know? It's a, uh... Cash and cash equivalents, bonds, bonds, fixed income, stocks, alternatives. All right. And stocks also called equities. I don't like equities because real estate is equity as well. So I say, so I, when I retired from USA, I was VP of equities. And I'm like, that's the wrong title. I'm VP of stocks, but it doesn't sound as impressive. But I wasn't responsible for real estate. So equity just means you have ownership. And when you buy real estate, you have ownership. So cash and bonds are the exact same things. So how do you distinguish between cash and bonds? So you need to put this on the exam and it's also gonna be on Wednesday's question. I'm gonna include the asset classes on Wednesday's class question. So the main key difference between cash and bonds is timing. Cash and cash equivalents is things that mature within a year. Bonds are things that mature after a year. We're specifically talking about loaning people money. So both cash and bonds, cash equivalents, you loan someone money. You don't have equity, you don't have ownership. You're just loaning them money, you're hoping they're gonna pay you back. Cash is when you loan out money and they're gonna get it back within a year. Bonds is when you loan out money and your money's not gonna come back until after a year, all right? So how do you really distinguish it? It's there's two risks. And this, you got to get into your answer. This is really, really critically important. Two risks, reinvestment risk and price risk. Reinvestment risk is the risk that you get your money back at the worst possible time when interest rates are really, really low. That's the risk of short-term cash with cash. Because cash, if interest rates fall, guess what happens to your income? It falls right in line. Right? The money in your savings account is just going to go up and down with interest rates. Now, if you put your money into a 10-year bond at 5% and interest rates fall, you're okay, aren't you? Because you locked in 5%, rates fall, you still got 5%. So longer-term bonds don't have that reinvestment risk because you have your money locked in for 10 years. All right? 
price risk is the risk that you own a bond and interest rates rise and the bond price falls. So today we saw interest rates fell, so bond prices went up. But the last year, interest rates have risen, so bond prices are falling. So that's price risk. That's the risk. It's also known as interest rate risk. That's the risk that interest rates rise and bond prices fall. Well, cash has essentially no price risk. Why? Because they adjust automatically interest rates. Interest rates rise, they start paying you more money. Interest rates fall, they pay you less. So they have reinvestment risk. You're very sensitive. Your income's very sensitive to interest rates rising and falling, but they don't have price risk. If you buy a money market mutual fund, which is essentially cash, its price is always $1. Never moves in price. No price risk. If you buy a 30-year treasury at 5%, you got 5% locked in for 30 years. Very little reinvestment risk. But if rates rise, that bond price is going to fall dramatically, 15, 20%. In fact, in 2022, bond, treasury bond prices were falling 20, 25, 30 percent in 2022 because interest rates were rising. Right. But if you already have it, you're locked in, right? You're locked in, but uh, you you have a loss. I mean, it's, it gets down to, let's say you buy 30 year treasury today at 2 percent. You got 2 percent locked in. What if you wake up tomorrow and the interest rate is 4 percent? How do you feel tomorrow? I'm sad. You're really sad. What do you wish you had done? Waited until, Waited until tomorrow. And if you try to sell that bond tomorrow, what's going to happen? I'm not going to. It's going to be a discount. Yeah. If you bought it for 1000 tomorrow, you may have to sell it for 600 okay. Now, what if interest rates are 4% today and you locked in and then tomorrow you wake up and interest rates are 2%? How do you feel? You're okay. really happy, right? You got 4%. What if you sell your bond tomorrow? You'll get 1400 1500 bucks, right? Because you got a bond that's paying four, the market's only paying two. That's price risk. You have a long term treasury and you lock in 2% and rates rise to four, you're going to be really upset and the market's going to tell you, you got you to cut your price. Now, Camille's right. If you don't sell the bond, you haven't technically lost anything, but emotionally, you have lost something. You yeah. could have gotten four if you just waited one day. Instead, you're locked in at two. So you're still upset. All right. So just because you don't sell it and you realize the loss, you really still have a loss. Okay. All right. So reinvestment risk is mainly affects what? Short term cash. Things maturing in a year because they move with interest rates. Your income moves up and down with interest rates, but they have no price risk. Now, bonds, be real careful. You can't say bonds have zero reinvestment risk and high price risk. That's not true. All right. So there's a very important word here. Y'all see this word right here? Two words, varying degrees. So you sent, you can say cash has high reinvestment risk and low price risk. For bonds, you have to say varying degrees of reinvestment and price risk. A two-year bond has significant reinvestment risk, but low price risk. A 30-year bond has what? Low reinvestment risk and high price risk, all right? So that's why I say varying degrees. And it depends on the duration of the bond, which we'll talk about later. So 30 years, zero coupon. What's a zero coupon? All it does is you buy today and it doesn't pay you money until 30 years. There's no interest. You buy for 200, it matures at a thousand bucks in 30 years. There's there is no reinvestment risk because there's nothing to reinvest until 30 years. All right. So varying degrees, make sure you get that, those words or whatever your words are, but something that says varying degrees, different levels, however you want to say it. Um, <clears throat> the lower duration, we'll talk about duration. The lower the duration, the more reinvestment risk you have and the less price risk you have. So how do you manage? So they go in opposite directions, right? If you're worried about price risk, you put everything in, in cash, but then you have all those reinvestment risks. Then you're worried the Fed's going to cut rates. If you're worried about reinvestment risk, you put all your money in 30-year bonds, and now you have all this price risk. How do you manage that? The most common approach to manage that is called lottery. I'm doing that with my church right now. Um, we have a new bookkeeper. We like the fact that we can get CDs at 4.5%, 5%. We can get treasuries at 45 So what she's going to do, she's going to have two CDs or two treasuries mature every month, one at the beginning of the month, one at the end of the month. And she'll just keep rolling them. There's three months. So, you know, we went, we went from having, you know, back in 2020, and having like $400 in miscellaneous income. Now we're going to have $6,000. Now 
That's that reinvestment risk. But we're taking advantage of it while the Fed allows us. The Fed starts cutting rates and won't be so, so wonderful. But we're laddering. So laddering means it kind of controls your reinvestment risk. I mean, controls your well, controls your reinvestment risk because you constantly have money to reinvest if rates have risen. If rates have fallen, then yeah, you're a little you're a little upset. But you have a little bit of a combination. You have some locked in, some not locked in, and you have that kind of combination. So laddering is the most important approach. There's two other common approaches. There's the bullet approach and the barbell approach. So laddering tries to spread it out. The bullet says, I know exactly what's gonna happen. I'm gonna bet I have all my money mature in five years. That would be pretty dangerous unless you really know what you're doing. A barbell says, forget the middle. I'm gonna have a lot of money early, a lot of money late, nothing in between. When would you do each of these strategies? Well, you have to read these books. So here's, um, let me do the other book first. No, that's not the other book. Now oh, here it is, Tuckman. All right. Bruce Tuckman, he's got a book that is 600 pages long. So if you bought his book, you could read three pages a day, you have it in a year. Pretty easy to read. He writes it so that you can actually read it as a as a book. It's not textbooky. It's it's a little bit more strategy. What I like about his book is he talks specifically about laddering, barbell, and bullet. When would you do one? When would you do the other? So he he has some good insights. Not as detailed as this. Bobozi, he's a famous person in in finance. He didn't actually write this book. He just edited it. In fact, this is a book written by a bunch of different people. <laughs> so each chapter is written by a different person. He probably wrote some of the beginning chapters. Um, know how to. It's getting more difficult to look inside the book. So they keep moving the button. Um, I wish I could show you the inside of the book, but I don't know how to do that. One student was yelling at me, one class, just click on that, click on that, and I don't know what he's saying. So I, I still don't see it, how to look inside the book. Do y'all see it anywhere? Um, there are other additions, and that may be part of the issue, huh? I'm sorry? Have you ever seen the bullet and barbell approach? Well, bully, bull and bar, the bullet is you have all your money maturing all at one day. So it's just a bullet. So you might have all your money maturing in five years because you have a really specific idea of what the Fed's going to do. A barbell, you have a lot of money that matures early and a lot of maturity money that matures late and nothing in between. All right. So what Bruce Tuckman does is he tells you when one of those strategies works, you know, based on what your opinion is about what the Fed's going to do, what interest rates are going to do, what inflation is going to do. He gives you specific strategies for that. <laughs> yeah, and it's in the class notes as well. It's called fixed income securities. They weren't, you know, bond people are not the greatest book title writers. <laughs> fixed income securities for tools for today's markets. It's an older edition. It's an easier read. It's not quite so technical. But Bozy's book is 1,800 pages. <laughs> and so um, not, and it's not a book you would just read. You're not going to read it audibly on a bike like I read on my books. It's, it's a textbook. It's more of a reference book. It's incredibly difficult. Let me see if I can get Fabazi, Fabozzi a little more current. So fixed, in, in, fixed income handbook. Here's a later edition. Let's see if this will let me look inside of it. Read sample. Maybe this will work. So what does he talk about? So he has an overview. Bonds, medium. You notice preferred stocks is in there. We're going to say that preferred, preferred stocks are fixed income. They're not stocks. So don't think of preferred stocks as stocks. 
Mortgage-backed securities we're going to talk about. Asset-backed we're going to talk about. We're not going to cover talk about covered bonds. Risk, interest rate risk, and reinvestment risk. What I just say, the two risks are between cash and bonds, interest rate risk, which is also known as price risk, and reinvestment risk. We'll talk some about prepayment and call, some about credit, inflation. We won't talk much, a little bit about liquidity, not much, though. Um, structure for interest rates, um, very, very important. Hopefully, you had some of that in your eco class. The yield curve, what defines the yield curve, the expectation theories, those kind of things really important. Bond pricing, we'll do a little bit about this. So we'll have some of this. Measuring interest rate risk, we're going to focus in on duration and convexity. All right, those are the two key ones. And then a little bit on data, and then they get into securities. And this is where this book gets complicated. Treasuries and agencies. We're not going to make a big deal between tre treasuries and agencies. In my mind, they're all the same. This is government debt. We are going to talk about municipal bonds and what's unique about them. We're going to talk about corporate bonds. We're not going to talk about leveraged loans. We're not, we are going to talk real quickly about structured. We're not going to do commercial paper. Commercial paper is essentially cash. It's when you loan money short term into corporations. That's what commercial paper is. We're not going to get into that in detail. We're not going to do floating rate securities, but floating rate securities are essentially high reinvestment risk and low price risk because they automatically adjust interest rates. We are going to talk about tips. This guy, Bronjani, Brinjo, I can't say his full name. I actually had a com phone conversation with him and I go, hey, you wrote the tips chapter. And he, so he mailed me his his chapter as a book. So his he wrote this chapter, but he also has an entire book on this that he autographed and sent to me. Um, Non-U.S. bonds we'll talk real quickly about. Uh, exchange trading bonds we'll talk a little bit about. Non-convertible preferred we're not going to get into other than saying preferred is fixed income. Private infrastructure debt, we're not going to talk about. We're going to get into mortgages. Why well, are you going to notice mortgage back, agency back, structured debt? These are all structured products. You're going to notice it's like half the book. And we're going to spend a very, very small time on that. And in John Tui's class, he might spend, I don't know, a few classes on it. So this to get you either excited or to change majors, because if you look at this, there is massive amount of detail and complexity right here, CMBS. There's a guy named Trey at Victory Capital. This is all he does. He knows it backwards and forwards. He can off the top of his head, you go, Trey, tell me everything about know about CMBS. Seven weeks later, he's still talking. <laughs> he knows everything about this. He can show you how to look them up on Bloomberg. He can tell you why he buys certain bonds, why he thinks he got another collateral. This, this one chapter, could be your entire career in finance. And I think that's what you should shoot for. Finance is all about complexity and specialization. As I always tell people, I don't know a whole lot about very little. That's what finance is all about. You learn something backwards and forwards. So like Andrew, he might like real estate, but someone might get him in the CMBS and say, you know what? That's even better. It's got some complexity. I kind of like it, but it's a fixed income security. Yeah, that may be a whole career. Who knows? How does he know if he does that? Well, he's sitting at his desk and his boss comes over and says, hey, we got this new CMBS bill for the we're starting. He says yes before his boss even finishes the sentence. When someone says, hey, I got something really complicated. We're starting and we're interested. We're wondering if you're interested. You always say yes. And you jump and you go do it. And that becomes your career. And then five years later, you're making seven digits and you're doing something that's really complicated, but it's easy for you because you've been doing it for five years. So each one of these chapters, credit card, asset back, that could be your entire career. Equipment loans and leases could be your entire career. CLOs could be your whole career. So when you look at this book, when you read it, say, wow, that's really complicated. That shouldn't depress you. It should excite you. Because if you can get into a job that's learning that, you sit there for six months, a year, three years, after three years, you know something 0.000001% of the world knows, and now you're extremely valuable. So the goal is to find something complex and then just trust the fact that you sitting there 50 hours a week, you're gonna learn it. And this book is full of that stuff. So look at this book with excitement because boy, there's so many places um, you could 
I mean, look how complex this book is. And it's heavy, 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 heavy math. A lot of formulas, a lot of calculations. My word, this book just goes on forever and ever and ever. So this, it's, um, how much does it cost? Does it even say? There's no price anywhere. So yeah, that's not bad. It's cheaper than a textbook and it's a lot more valuable than a textbook. It would be a really good resource book to have. I think um, Tuckman's book is a lot cheaper because it's not, his is not usually used as a textbook. So it's more of a, kind of, it's, kind of, it's a good training book. I, I've read his book and I thought it was really, really good. I don't know what else he's written. I don't really know his background. Um, so fixed income is a world into itself. Undergraduate students, it's like they all say it's all about stocks, but it really, really isn't. Fixed income is a whole world. There's more bonds in the world than there are stocks. It's a much bigger value of the world, investment world. So um, keep an open mind. All right, so cash versus fixed income. Can you all handle that on Wednesday? They're both the exact same thing in, in that you're loaning money to people. The difference is on what? So you say cash, it's, what distinguishes cash is that it's duration. Duration, the short-term loans, the two risk, you remember those? We invest in risk, price risk or interest rate risk, all right? If you got that, you got it down. Three stocks or equity is that's ownership and a company. The key risk we're gonna talk about there are, are, are beta um, capitalization style and U.S. versus non-U.S. That's the key breakout. So you don't need to have that now, but that's where we're going to break it out. Stocks. You want U.S. stocks. You want defensive stocks. You want cyclical stocks. You want large stocks, small stocks. You want growth stocks. You want value stocks. You want U.S. stocks, emerging market stocks, developed market stocks, frontier market stocks. Those are your choices there. In alternatives is everything else. We're going to be real specific in our alternatives. We're not going to do many. I was just reading an article this week on um, one really growing um, alternative, which is infrastructure. Infrastructure is a really big deal right now because a lot of governments are building bridges, building toll roads. I don't know if you knew you can invest in those kind of things. You can buy a toll road and make money off of that. So it's it's interesting. So we'll get into some of those. We're going to keep it pretty simple. We're going to focus on real assets like real estate and uh, timber and commodities. So we're not going to get too. We're, we probably won't talk infrastructure, but I might show you that article just to show you the, that it's there. So alternatives, alternatives tend to change over time. So when I started my career, emerging market stocks, so buying stocks in China or South Africa. That was that was an alternative. That was very rare. Not many people did it. Today, it's real common. Everybody includes emerging markets under stocks. It's not an alternative. Emerging market debt, for most people, is still an alternative. But for some people, they include it under debt. So you can see how it depends on the person. At USA, real estate was a separate asset class. So we had five asset classes. But for a lot of people, real estate is other alternatives. There's some that you can question. Currencies is currencies an asset. We could talk about that. Hedge funds. I don't consider hedge fund to be an alternative, but we'll talk a little bit about hedge funds. Private equity will be on my list, including venture capital. So private equity, I do include as an alternative. Some people might put it under stocks, but I put it as an alternative. Other real assets that I don't know much about. I'm on artwork and coins and and. Uh, old vehicles, those kind of, I don't know anything about that kind of stuff, but there are people who, who do that. That's their entire career. So we'll talk about those. So this, the alternatives definition is going to change over time. This is the one area where you may have a different list. This list is fine for our purposes. It's pretty conventional. So you're you're fine learning it this way. So, yeah. What are some kind of version of market on? I'm sorry. Can you explain a little bit of, of, of market bond? Well, a bond is you loan money. So emerging market is a country like China or um, Brazil. So we'll talk about there's most people now there's sovereign debt and there's corporate debt. Sovereign debt is you loan money to the government. 
Emerging market debt is mainly people loaning money to the governments, not the corporations. It's a little tricky to go into an emerging country and loan money to the corporations because it's a little dangerous. And most emerging countries, they, their, their businesses borrow money from banks. So we're mainly talking about loaning money to governments. Governments are pretty dangerous, though, aren't they? Uh, any of y'all want to loan money to Argentina right now? New president. They've just come through a major crisis. Pretty dangerous stuff. Who knows? Colombia just elected a new president. It's pretty, you know, there's a lot of kind of tricky stuff. My my Spanish teachers in Peru, and, and uh, I always make a mistake of asking her about politics. And oh my word, the next five minutes, I have no clue what she's saying because she gets so animated. My Spanish isn't fast enough, but it's just a lot of political turmoil everywhere. Um, what does that mean for loaning money? It could be a great idea because Argentina, maybe you could buy their debt 20 cents on the dollar. And maybe this new president does get it all fixed. People are kind of, they're not that they dislike him. It's just like he's a little weird, a little quirky. If any of y'all voted for him, I'm sorry, but he's a little quirky. And so they're like, he's saying some of the right stuff. And then he's saying some really weird stuff. Which person is going to show up? You know? So are you willing to make that bet? If you, if you put 20 cents on the dollar, they don't have to mature on time. If you do get 20, you pay 20 cents on the dollar and they only give you 40 cents on the dollar, you still made 100%. So it's not worth it. You know, so so it's a dangerous asset class, but that means there's a lot of opportunities there. All right. So let's start with cash. No, so you're going to see this part of the discussion I have. There's three things you gotta you gotta handle. One is define what this thing is. Secondly, give the sub asset classes, and third, give the strategy. All right, define sub asset classes and strategy. So just think CSS or DSS. Define subcategories and strategy. Cash, I don't have subcategories. I'm just saying cash is cash. All right, so all cash is one asset class. Cash is loans we make to corporations and governments that mature in less than a year. Things like treasury bills. Anytime you see the word bill, that's loaning money to U.S. government that matures in less than a year. These are discount bonds, so they don't pay interest. Instead, you buy it for 98 and it matures at 100. So all your earnings is the change in the price, all right? They're discount notes. That's what a discount note is. Agency secure agencies, they're essentially the same as you have a government. They can maybe give you slightly higher return, but not a whole lot. Corporate bonds, when they borrow short term, again, that's commercial paper, usually high quality. And then anything says money market, money market checking, money market savings account. Bank CDs that mature in less than a year are essentially cash. Money market demand accounts are like buying, buying cash from mutual funds or banks, money market mutual funds. So you're just you're essentially putting money into an account where they're they're loaning money to governments, they're loaning money to corporations, and you're just collecting your money together. Your checking account and savings account are technically cash investments. A lot of people don't think of their checking account as an investment. It's part of your emergency fund, but your emergency fund is how you're gonna handle your cash. So that's cash. Cash tends to be very low expected return because you're just, you know, you're just parking your money there until you figure out what to do with it. So it tends to be low expected return. I mean, what is your checking account paying you right now? Do you even notice it? Yeah, it's really small. I get like 18 cents a month or something, 14 cents. Not much. The expected risk is generally really low except for what? Reinvestment risk. So if rates fall, you're in a lot of trouble because you're just going to move with, you know, your savings account is just going to move around with interest rates. You have to worry about inflation. Cash is generally, even though it goes up when inflation goes up because rates rise, generally cash doesn't keep up with inflation. We usually make less than inflation. So it's not a good inflation protection. Now, if you knew inflation is going to take off like in 2022, cash wouldn't be a bad place to park just because everything else is going to fall in price. And cash would just kind of sit there, but it's it's not a great. In fact, I know very few investors that cash is actually an asset cap class, that they don't actually allocate to cash as an investment. Cash is just where they park money until they figure out what to do with it. Um, 
The credit risk is generally really low, although in 2008, when AIG and Lehman Brothers went under, it did cause some losses. And people freaked out in 98 because some of these mutual funds, money market accounts that are supposed to always be at a dollar, they fell below a dollar. It's called breaking the buck. But even then, it wasn't that big of a deal. So there was one, one money market account that broke the buck. It was the oldest one in existence, a pretty large fund. And people are freaking out, but it fell from a dollar to 98 cents. It lost 2%. The stock market was down 40% and this thing lost too. People were freaking out too. Why? Because you're not supposed to lose money on cash. So that's how low risk it is. Someone lost 2% on this and people are freaking out. Like how can that happen? It's correlation. Remember you're thinking return, risk and correlation. The correlation is pretty unstable how cash correlates with other things, but cash tends to do pretty well in a crisis. I mean, if I told you the stock market was gonna crash 50%, Sticking all your money in cash wouldn't be a bad thing to do and just wait it out until it fell and then come back in. It'd be a pretty obvious thing to do. I mean, I would probably short the stock market in that case. And when the market falls 50, I'll make 50. That'd be even better. But cash is not a bad place to go. If everything's falling 50 and you got something that's making you close to zero, that's not too bad. So in a crisis, the correlation is pretty good. It tends to go make zero and everything else is down 30, 40%. So that's that's probably pretty good. It has a lot of liquidity generally, gives you a lot of liquidity, gives you a holding place. I don't know if this phrase means anything, keeps one's powder dry, but that's kind of a saying, you kind of just, you're not gonna shoot all for your bullets. You're gonna kind of wait, hold back. And then, so I did some of that in 2020. I was really short on cash. I'm short on stocks going into 2020. I was kind of holding cash, not expecting a pandemic, but I was just worried about the stock market. And then when it crashed, well, I started dumping my money back in. So I had it sitting there in a holding place. Um, I say generally, <laughs> so 2008, I still remember such a strange experience, but I was doing options on our stock portfolios. So I had these massive gains. So I go over to Donna, she's the bond person. Donna retired here recently, but we worked close together. We got along really, really well, but she loved to roll her eyes at me because she was like, oh, not you again. Um, because I would make her life miserable. I go, hey, Donna, we got some options maturing. It's got 300 million bucks. It's gonna show up tomorrow, just letting you know. She goes, what do you want me to do with that? So we'll just invest it. She says, I, I can't invest it. So we'll just buy T-bills. She says, I can't buy T-bills. And I thought she was joking because she had a really dry sense of humor, but she wasn't joking. I said, you can't, what do you mean you can't buy T-bills? That's the most liquid asset on the planet. She says, there are no T-bills to buy. Oh, and I'm going, how can there not be any T-bills to buy? She says, everybody that owns T-bills in 2008 is clinging on to them with both fists. They are not selling them. There is nothing for me to buy. And I said, well, good luck with that. 300 million shows up tomorrow. So <laughs> like, not my problem, but sorry, I caused you a problem. So, yeah. Well, yeah. So you're saying like, from very time the markets down with like, right, so we should just like, take our money out like this. Well, you want to move it to cash before it crashes. After it crashes, you probably want to move back in. So timing's everything. So I don't know who's good at figuring out timing at all. I thought the market was going to crash in 98. I was right for like three weeks and then it came roaring back and then it crashed in 2000. So I was two years early. It's it's tough to get the timing on that right. But cash is generally a very, very safe place to be if the markets are crashing. You probably feel happy that you're there. Huh? We're going to so we're gonna dig into like what the indicators there are, I guess, um, general overview. Like, this class, not so much as far as like trying to time markets to figure out. Yeah, I don't know if there is an undergraduate class that really does that. Professors tend to be markets are efficient. If you want to know my ideas, I can show them to you. I'm a big fan of um, Ned Davis Research, and they have some really good indicators. Ned Davis, NDR, Ned Davis Research. And they supposedly, I don't use Twitter or whatever it is now, X. Supposedly, Ned Davis Research has a lot of free stuff on Twitter. And so look for them. It's called NDR, Ned Davis Research. They're, they're the best. In fact, in 2009, they called us. We use them all the time. They call us and say, we have, I forget how many, nine, 10 indicators at the bottom of the market. 
And in uh, March of that year, they called us and said, we've never had a case where every indicator is screaming to buy, except for right now, every indicator is screaming to buy. And that was the best place to buy. So yeah, that was really good. The indicators are much better calling the bottoms of markets than calling, calling the top. Tops usually keep going <laughs> well beyond they should. But the bottoms, you can tell why, mainly because of retail investors. When you see retail investors start selling, you're at the bottom. The problem is on the top, the retail investors just keep going way too long. But when you see retail investors start selling, they, they hang on, they hang on, it's going to come back, it's going to come back, and they finally give up. Institutional investors are buying, retail investors are selling, that's the bottom of the market. So, you know, there's indicators like that. But we're not going to do that in this class. Just you could spend you could spend a lot of time. There's so many of them out there. Um, I do recommend uh, GMO.com. They have some really good articles on that kind of thing. Um, Oak Free Capital is another one. There's there's places you can go that definitely have some really good stuff. All right, so that's cash. Cash is generally very liquid, but there are times in strange markets where they may not be. All right, then talk about bonds. I'm gonna check it out real quick. Bonds. So bonds are subcategories. Well, okay, so we've got DC cuts I, and under each one of those letters, there's going to be the fine um, subcategories and strategy, all right? Anybody remember DC cuts I? D is duration, complexity, credit. DC cuts you. Oh, cut. Do we say credit, right? So yeah. duration, convexity, credit, U. So US versus non US. T. Not T for Texas, but change one letter. T for taxes. S. Structure. structure. We talked about structure. That's a big chunk of Fabozzi's book. We're only going to have it as one little letter and go really quick through it. And then the last one, I, inflation. inflation, all right? So that's my list. I think it's a great list. I've asked a lot of fixed income people to add more stuff to it, and they can't think of it. Now, structure is massive. So, yeah, I've kind of cheated and stuck, but that's just because it's an undergraduate class. We really can't get into structure in here. So under D, duration, we're going to have the defined subcategories and strategy, all right? So duration, the definition is the weighted average time to maturity using discounted cash flows as the weights. That's the technical definition. As an undergraduate student, you should know how to calculate duration. I'm going to show it to you when we price bonds because it's really, really simple to do. It's a really easy calculation. I don't know how many of y'all Googled duration and looked it up or modified duration. Uh, it's not that complex of a concept. It can get really complex when we talk about convexity, but basic definition is pretty straightforward. It's just really, it's not maturity. So a 10-year bond has maturity in 10 years, but that only looks at one cash flow, and that's that final maturity cash flow. Duration looks at all cash flows, including all those coupon payments. And because a 10-year bond has a bunch of coupon payments, its duration is not 10 years. It may be eight and a half years. Because some of your cash flow is coming earlier. That's what duration is telling you. Not maturity, but the weighted average time you have your cash flows. The categories, I did it kind of out of out of order, but that's the definition. Your categories, I think Vanguard came up with these categories back in the early 80s, but short-term bonds, intermediate-term bonds, and long-term bonds, three categories. Short term that have low duration, intermediate term bonds, and long term bonds that have long duration. So those are your three categories. Which of these would have the highest reinvestment risk? Long -term. The highest reinvestment risk. Oh, short, short term. Which would have the highest price risk? Long term. All right. So you have always have that kind of battle between the two. If you think interest rates are going to rise, do you want short term bonds or long term bonds? Short term. Why? Because you want your money maturing so you can reinvest at the higher rates. If you think rates are going to drop, what do you want? Long term. There's your strategy. All right. Now, there is another formula that's really famous. Every undergraduate student should know this formula. It gives you a, an estimate of how much a bond price is going to move when interest rates change. 
And the formula is minus duration times the change in yield. Some students get confused. This is not the formula for duration. This is the formula for how you use duration once you've calculated how you use it to estimate how much interest rate risk you have. And it's minus duration because when rates rise, prices fall. So you have to do the negative. So if your duration is five years and interest rates rise, rise 100 basis points, then minus five times 0 0.01, that bond should fall 5%. If your duration is two, two years, interest rates water is 1%, that bond would only fall 2%. All right, so duration gives you a good sense. So if your duration is 10 years, which will be very long term, interest rates rise 100 basis points, that's going to fall 10%. It's a fairly dramatic and hit. So duration is the measure of price risk. And so your, the higher duration, the more price risk you have more sensitive you are to changes in interest rates. If you have a duration of eight years and your boss says, what happens if interest rates rise 200 basis points, then minus a positive eight duration times a rise in rates means that bond is gonna fall 16%. I had a boss that used this formula all the time. He liked to show off. Oh yeah, that's gonna fall about four percent. Why he's just talking because it's pretty easy to do the math once you get used to it. Pretty easy math to do, <laughs> right? So the definition is essentially uh, duration is a measure of how much interest rate price risk you have. Is that how much time until you get your cash flows back? You have short term, intermediate term, and long term. You can use this formula to help get a sense of what duration is telling you. And then um, generally the yield curve is upward sloping. It's not right now, but generally it's upward sloping. So the more duration risk you take, the more income you're going to get. All right. So you can actually look at some historical curves. This isn't the one to do it, though. Let me get the. I should have linked a different one. They changed their site and it's kind of kind of frustrating. So this is the side I love. So, um, so there's a more more normal, not that normal. Mm. See if we can find. Yeah, that's a little more normal. So you can see how as you go out more in maturity, you have higher interest rates. So there's a temptation, right, to go out longer term bonds because short term bonds. Are only paying you half a percent, but if you go out five years, you can make two percent. So you can make four times more income. That's tempting, isn't it? But the problem is, if interest rates rise, you're going to lose a lot more money on that five-year bond than you will on the six months. So you've got a decision to make. What did Silicon Valley banks decide? Let's buy this stuff way out here and get the higher income. And then what happened? Interest rates rose. They had massive losses, and they went out of business. Right. They decided to roll the dice, and when you roll the dice in Vegas, sometimes you lose. They did it with other people's money, so that's, to me, more unethical. When you gamble with your money, I'm fine with that. When you gamble with other people's money, like Silicon Valley Bank did, that's kind of dangerous. But normally, the yield curve is upward sloping, so you have some temptation to go out to longer-term bonds. So if someone says, I don't think rates are going to change at all, they're going to stay right where they are, and you have a normal yield curve, then yeah, go out to five years. If rates are going to change, you lock in the higher yield and you make more income. Now, I, I had a, 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 a one portfolio manager I was talking to, and he told his clients interest rates are rising, so suck them all in cash. So they're making 0.5%. They could have been making you know 3%, 2.5%. He had them at 0.5. And, and rates are going to rise. Next year, rates haven't risen, so they're still making 0.5. Two years ago, two years later, they're still at 0.5. Three years later, they're still at 0.5. What has he just done? He's just destroyed their income. He had them locked in at 0.5 because he kept them short term. Rates never rose. They could have been making that two, two and a half percent. Instead, they're stuck at half percent. Yes. Yeah, so, what do you mean by duration? You said like what duration is it take? Duration is another word for maturity. So, are you comfortable with the word maturity? So maturity is if you if you buy a 10-year treasury, you're loaned the government money for 10 years. 
They're going to pay you interest every six months. And in 10 years, what are they going to do? They can pay the principal back. So the maturity is 10 years. Maturity only looks at one cash flow, the very, very last one. Duration says there's other cash flows. You're getting coupons every six months. So there's actually 20 cash flows. What duration says is what's the average maturity when you have all of those cash flows? It's not 10 years. It's more like eight and a half years. All right. Duration and convexity, duration and maturity are real similar, but they're not identical. Now, some things like a mortgage, with a mortgage, you don't just get interest, do you? You get interest and principal. So a mortgage pays you monthly interest and principal. So a 30-year mortgage may have a duration only of 10 years because you're getting so much more cash earlier. All right. So maturity is usually related to duration. They're usually close. But if you have a bond that's paying interest and principal, the duration will be much shorter. So a five-year car loan. When you have a car loan, what do you pay? You pay interest and principal every month. So a five-year car loan may have a duration only of 2.4 years. Whereas if you loan the money to the government for five years, they only pay you interest. The duration of that's probably four and a half years. All right. So there is a relationship, but it's not precise. It depends on the bond. All right. So you have some incentive to go out longer term. And so when you're worried about price risk and you go shorter term, you're usually giving up income to do that. Today, that's not true. Today, you can buy stuff, you know, three months. That's much higher than five years, but that's because we expect those three months rates to stop dropping, start dropping pretty fast. That's not a normal situation. But yeah, that's, you have to make these decisions. It can be really tough. Silicon Valley said, man, we're getting so much more out of three, four or five years. Let's go out there. But that's really dangerous for a bank to do because then you start having all these losses. So it's, you gotta, you gotta make these decisions. They're pretty tough decisions. So What's your strategy? So the define, we talked about define. We have the sub-asset classes, short-term, intermediate, and long-term. So what is your strategy? Depends on the direction of rates, all right? Duration is about the direction of rates. Are they rising or falling? Convexity is about the volatility of rates, but duration is about the direction of rates. We'll talk about convexity here soon. So your boss believes interest rates are going to rise significantly over the next 12 months. What do you want to do with the duration of your portfolio. Do you want to lengthen it or shorten it? Shorten it. And those are the words you use. Don't say increase. Don't say lessen. I don't know who came up with these terms. These aren't my terms. I'm using, in an interview, you say shorten or lengthen duration. If you say increase duration, is it wrong? It's not wrong, but lengthen sounds like a finance professional. Increase sounds like a college student. Which do you want to sound like? You want to sound like a professional. Lengthen. So someone someone comes up with the first term, we all follow them afterwards. So if you expect rates to rise, you want to shorten duration. If you expect rates to fall, you want to lengthen duration. So your boss ex expects rates will fall dramatically. This may be what a lot of bosses are saying. Lengthen duration. If you're normally five-year duration, go out seven or eight years. And lock in. I've been doing that since 2020. Uh, in 2020, I was short duration. I was like a negative duration. I was expecting rates to rise. And then in, in 2022, when the rates rose, I started lengthening out my duration. As the interest rates here, 3%, 35 4, 4.5, 5, I just kept lengthening out my duration. And so now I'm kind of benefiting. Rates come back down. Last year, that helped me a lot. So far this year, it's been, or end of last year, it helped me a lot. So I might have been a little early doing that, but I was negative duration. You can be negative duration. So when rates rise, you actually make money. You can do that. Uh, so that's where I was in 2020. But starting starting really in 2022, I started lengthening out duration, take advantage of those higher interest rates, start locking them in, because eventually I knew the Fed was going to start cutting and lock in those higher income. Uh, <clears throat> now, this gets a little bit trickier because there's a little more going on here. So and your macroeconomics class, you probably talked about when do rates generally fall? What's going on in the economy? So when does the Fed usually cut interest rates? In a strong economy or a weak economy? Weak, yeah. They want to cut rates in a weak economy to bring the economy back. 
So if rates are falling, that probably means the economy is pretty weak. If rates are rising, it's probably a strong economy or you have some inflation like we had in 2022. So you're not just saying, you're, you're really talking about inflation and the economy. If we expect inflation, rates are gonna rise. If you're expecting a recession, rates are probably gonna fall. And I say expecting, the bond market doesn't wait. If the market's expecting inflation, when do interest rates rise? Today or when inflation rises? Today. today, right? They expect inflation next year. Interest rates rise today. It's not like bond managers out there. Oh man, inflation is going to rise. I got to buy this bond at two percent. No, those will say I won't buy the bond. Rates are rising, and that causes the yields to go up today. So the bond market moves before the economy. So if we're expecting a recession. Yields are going to fall now. Expecting the Fed to cut in the future. So the bond market is actually one of the best indicators of what's going on in the economy. I look at it very closely for all kinds of insights on inflation, on the US dollar, on all kinds of things. We know there's a relationship between interest rates and the dollar, right? If interest rates rise, the dollar is gonna strengthen. If interest rates fall, the dollar is gonna weaken. So there's, you know, if you can get higher interest rates in US and the US dollar, that's gonna make the US dollar stronger. People will invest in US dollars. So there's a lot of things going on. We're not gonna get quite that complex here, but you need to get that complex. You need to start thinking in those terms. There's multiple things going on. What's the Fed doing? What are interest rates? What are inflation? Uh -huh. Yeah, if, if you have if you have a portfolio, so he's asking how do you actually do that? So you have a portfolio, you would sell your 10-year bonds and buy some five-year bonds. Yeah. Yes, it's that simple. Now, today you can do with exchange traded funds. So the fund I did in 2020 was like, it's shorted treasuries. So it's like short 20 years. So instead of owning 20 years, I was shorting 20 years. So if interest rates rise, the 20 year falls. Well, they were short to 20. So if the 20 year falls, that portfolio was up. So it's a lot easier to manage it. It's even easier to manage it with futures and, and derivatives. So futures allow you, you can do all kinds of things. So it's, it's actually pretty easy to manage your duration. At USA, my risk management class, we're going to talk about USA's pension plan. I was managing its duration. I could I could manage three billion dollars of duration in a in a three minute phone call using swaps. It's really, really easy to do. Interest rate swaps are an easy way to lengthen a certain duration. Just just nanosecond. It's really powerful. <clears throat> but yeah, your personal portfolio is you can you can you can just do it by buying and selling different bonds. CDs, certificates of deposit get a little tricky because they charge a penalty if you, you get out early, right? So those are a little tricky. But other things are, you know, if you have a, a bond mutual fund, you have a long-term bond mutual fund, you would sell your long-term mutual fund and buy an intermediate mutual fund, and you would be, be shortening your duration. All right, so let's see if y'all can do it. So the DC cut side, duration is the first one. How many things you want to talk about under duration? Depth so, define so categories strategy define Jalen can probably define it now, but anybody else? Someone says duration also the same as maturity. You would say close, but not quite. So you got to get that definition. What are the subcategories? Short, short term, and immediate, and long term. Short term might be like two year bonds. Intermediates like five to 10 year bonds and in home terms, the longer stuff, although it's not a real clear. And then the strategy, the strategy is always gonna start with, if you expect blank, do this. So here, if you expect what with duration? Interest rates to rise, you want to short, short duration, all right? So that the strategy is you expect something. Some students forget the word expect. Some students say, if interest rates are rising, I want a certain duration. What's wrong with that? Right. It's, yeah, it's too late. <laughs> so that's like saying, hey, if the horses have escaped the barn, I'm going to close the barn doors. That's too late, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to expect, if you expect rates to rise, you want to shorten now. You don't want to wait for them to rise and then shorten because then you've already lost your money. All right, so keep that word expected in there. That's really, really important. All right, now convexity, we're not supposed to cover in this class, but I'm going to anyway, because you've got to have, you have exposure to it. And then one of my, 
one of my students in another class said, John Tui doesn't talk convexity that much in his investment, his fixed income class. So you're not going to see it much. It's an important concept. It's quite complex. It's the hardest part of this first exam. So if you miss this, it doesn't kill you on the exam, but it's an important concept. Um, so convexity is, is like the, the second derivative of bond prices relative to interest rates. So it's like the change in the change. So duration, duration is saying, what happens as interest rates go up and down? So convexity is saying, well, what happens as duration changes? All right, so it gets really tricky, but if interest rates rise, duration falls. As interest rates fall, duration rises. So duration is not this constant thing. It's changing itself. So um, one of my students built this website, which is really, really cool. I don't know how he did it, did it in Python, I guess. So you can put the maturity of the bond in there, it's coupon and it's yield. So let's do a 10 year bond. Let's say it has a coupon of 4% and a yield of 4%. So the price of the bond is $1,000. It's a 10 year bond, so its maturity is 10 years, but what's its duration? Its duration is 8.18 years. And what is this convexity? Well, it's convexity is 83. Now that's not gonna mean much to you. I'll show you the formula for convexity. It's a, the formula for calculating convexity, I don't have memorized. I don't know if I've ever had it memorized. It's a massive formula. And from Bozzi's book, he actually calculates convexity. In the book I had, he had a math error. It was really irritating because I'm trying to practice convexity. It's a very massive formula. So you should know the formula for duration. You probably shouldn't know the formula for convexity. Convexity is going to know how to handle it. All right. So what you'll notice is if I go to a 30-year bond, watch, what's duration going to do if I go to a 30-year bond? It's going to increase. What do you think convexity is going to do? It increases a little or a lot? A whole lot. Now, do we like convexity or not like convexity? I'm going to tell you we love convexity. All right. Let me explain convexity to you. Let me start with a two-year bond. The blue line is how the bond price would move if all we have is that duration formula, minus duration times the change in yield, because that's just a straight line. The green line is how the bond price actually moves. Pretty close, isn't it? The blue line is straight line, minus duration times the change in yield. The green line is the actual move, but pretty close, right? Duration gets us pretty close. What do you notice about the green line versus the blue line? How often does the green line go below the blue line? Never. This is called positive convexity. Most bonds have positive convexity. That means when interest rates rise, their prices go up a little more than what duration would say. When interest rates rise, their bond prices fall, but not as much as duration would tell you. Do you, do you like convexity or not? It never hurts you, does it? What about the... 30-year bond, what do you think? Do you notice any convexity there? Pretty dramatic. How well, how good of a job does duration do in forecasting the price now? If prices, if interest rates fall a bunch, duration says the price rises to 1688, it actually rises to over $2,000. Not a very good forecast. Down here, if rates rise, it says the bond price falls to $200. It actually follows the two six six fifty one. Do you like convexity here? Wonderful thing. I love convexity. Uh, uh, yeah, so um, the convexity is like so much more accurate. Why do we need duration? Well, duration is a good. Well, it's a lot easier, right? And it's a pretty good. And it does a pretty good job because even on this bond, it does a pretty good job. You know, if interest rates only rise one hundred basis points, you see how close they are. So convexity is not very important unless what? Interest rates move a bunch. That's why I say convexity is all about the volatility of interest rates. You don't care about convexity if interest rates aren't moving much. But when interest rates move a bunch, convexity becomes really, really important. All right, so good setup question, Galen. Someone else, Carlos? Yeah, I was going to ask you why the middle is so close. Well, because you'll see in this formula, I think I gave you all the formula. I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember if I gave you all the formula or not. It's in the it's in the class notes. I'll I'll show you. There's there, the formula of convexity. You'll notice that you divide by two in squares. So convexity is a really small number, and you're going to square it and divide by two. 
So it doesn't have much impact until rates move a bunch. So you take the yield, divide by two and square it. So that 0 0.01 divided by two is 0 0.005 squared is like, yeah. so it doesn't have much, but when you get out 300, 400 basis points, it starts to become important. That's why convexity is all about volatility. You're going to see that. Now, the subcategories are pretty easy. You have bonds with positive convexity and bonds with negative convexity. All right. So that's what we're going to talk about. So it gets, we may spend most of the next class talking about this. Any of y'all have had convexity before? Oh, really? Yeah. That's why I said that. It's a very long formula. Oh, it's massive. Yeah. I have a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet. I, I think I put it on Canvas that has the actual formula. It's, I showed it in class, and this student went out and took that spreadsheet and put it on the internet. So that's what I was showing you. So it has a full convexity. You have to look in like four different places to see the full formula. There's like this massive formula here, and you take that and divide it into this other massive formula. So it's like pretty messy. All right. So we'll start on convexity next class. So right this week, Someone ask you what you're studying this week and say, I'm, I'm studying bond duration and convexity. They'll be really impressed. All right. Hopefully they won't have a follow-up question yet, but maybe after the Wednesday's class. All right. So how, what would you say on the bond market today? Uh, bond price is uh, rose. Of the drastically of the U.S. Treasury yield fell 9.2 basis points. Closing at 3.967%. Good, good. So we'll see on Friday. So you got the employment report. I might add that this, this is the first time below 4% in three weeks or whatever. Four, that 4% 4 is a really, really psychologically important number, just like the 5% was. So I would, I might key in on that. We'll see what happens on Friday. Um, if we get a strong report, it's possible we could jump back above 4 The The Fed's obviously watching closely these numbers to see if the economy is a little overdone. The, there's a lot of bait about the Fisher curve right now. You might have studied that economics class, but what's the relationship between un, the unemployment rate and inflation? And you would think there are relationship because if you know unemployment's really low, there's a shortage of workers. So you would think that would be inflationary, but that the Fisher curve has is, is somewhat disappeared and then Maybe it's coming back. Who knows? People are debating that. So you'll see. You'll see when you come in on Friday. You know, first thing Friday morning. This is this is the rest of your life. The first Friday of every month, you're going to be jumping out of bed to go look at the employment report because it's just the most important number we look at. Everybody's going to be talking about it. We'll see if it has a big of an impact, impact as the Fed did today. So the Fed's probably has some pretty good indication of what Friday's going to look like already. They're not just sitting there waiting. Or a number to come out, they have inside information. So he's probably setting the markets up for that. So there may have been some preemptive market reaction today, but we'll see. Strong report. You know, normally you see a strong report, you would think stocks would rally. It's possible to get a strong report and they sell off because of the Fed. So we've had this thing where we talk about bad news is good news. We're in a good news is bad news environment. I remember watching a a news program and they got bad economic news and the stock market rallied and the guy said, this is capitalism. It hates, it hates America. And all the, you know, it's like, no, they're, they're reacting to the same thing. U S consumers to be concerned about a bad numbers. That means the economy is not overheated. The fed can come back. That's good for consumers. The market isn't out there going, I hope U S consumers all do horribly because that's their, that's their customers. There is not a distance. It's not like Wall Street does great and consumers do horribly. That's not possible. They're all the same customers. And so you get good news and the market sells off. That's Fed related. You get bad news. The market rallies. That's Fed related right now. So we're really focused on the Fed right now. And the Fed's really focused on how strong the economy is. So Friday should be interesting to be sure. All right. So let's get into this convexity. Did any of y'all read up convexity? Pretty complex stuff, isn't it? You could keep drilling down, drilling down, drilling down. You can see some papers on convexity that are just unreadable, very, very mathematical. So convexity is that second order. So duration is worried about whether rates are rising or falling. Convexity worried about how volatile rates are. And I showed y'all the 
the, the internet site. So why is convexity important? Convexity comes down to this important concept of an embedded option. There are certain bonds that provide the borrower some options of what to do. Some bonds don't, like treasuries don't. If you borrow money, if the treasury borrows money for 10 years, they have to pay that off over the next 10 years. They can't pay it off early. That's not allowed. I know President Trump said that, but it's not allowed. The bond market actually got a little nervous when he said, we'll just pay off all the treasury debt early. And treasury prices are like 110, 115. Why? Because interest rates were so low. And he's saying, well, we'll just pay it all off at 100. He can't do that. That's illegal. But you, as a mortgage holder on your house, you can pay off your debt early, can't you? Yeah. If you want to refinance. So you do have that option. The federal government doesn't, but you have that option. What about your auto loan? Can you pay that off early? Yeah, you can. So you have the option. So when do you exercise that option? When if it's you as the you as the borrower, do you execute it when it's in the bank's best interest or when it's in your best interest? Your best interest, right? So that option hurts the lender and helps the borrower. So when you pay off your mortgage, if you have a 4% mortgage, and mortgage rates are 8%, what are you going to do? You're paying for, and the current rates are 8 Are you going to refinance? Just keep doing what you're doing. You're going to pay a little extra to pay it off early? No. You might actually, if you were paying, if your mortgage is 1000 you were paying 1200 you might say, you know what? I'm going to go back to just paying the 1000 and take that 200 and go buy a 7% bank CD because my interest rate's 4 Why not make 7% on that money? If your mortgage rate's 8% and current rates are four, what would you do? Refinance. Refinance. What's the duration of that? Okay. It was a 30-year mortgage. Now what is it? It's a zero-day mortgage. There is no duration. The bank like that? Would they rather you keep paying 8% or are they glad you paid it all off today? You paid off all today. What do they have to do? They have to go out and make a new mortgage at 4%. That's not good for them. So... These options, for the most part, there's a few strange ones, but these options, for the most part, benefit the borrower and harm the lender. All right. And it creates negative convexity. This is where negative convexity comes in. Why? Because when interest rates fall, you're expecting your bond price to go up. But instead, if your bond price is going up, you get all your money back at par. You would have liked to keep making 8%. Now you get all your money back at par. So... If you got a bond, you know, bond prices go up and rates fall, then I can go up if you can pay off at 100. You know, if bond prices can go to 105, 110, 115, but you can pay it off at 100. There's a good chance that bond price isn't going to rise. And that's why you don't get that positive convexity. So essentially, this is what will blow your mind. When I first heard this, it's like, wow, these are really cool, cool uh, bonds. Essentially, what we call is a straight bond, which means it's a bond without an option. With an option, you're selling a call option on top of it. So when you loan money to someone, when a bank loans money on a mortgage, they're doing a normal loan, and then they're also selling an option, an interest rate option on top of that. We'll talk about options later in the class. Option pricing is pretty complicated stuff, and that's what is going on here. We'll learn later in class that the most important input to an option, like a stock option, is volatility. That's the most important input. Same thing here, volatility. If you borrow at 6% on your mortgage and interest rates never change the next 30 years, what are you going to do? You're just going to pay 6% for 30 years. Nothing's going to happen. But if interest rates get real volatile, what happens? They may go up to 8, they may drop down to 4. What are you going to do? You're going to refinance as soon as they do what? Drop down to 4. So what does volatility do? It gives you more chances to execute against the bank. All right? So embedded options, if you did the Wikipedia uh, on convexity or on OAS or embedded options, they're all tied together. You'll see all those links in there. Uh, Josh? Is there some sort of a fee to refinance? Well, um, well I, I had to refinance my church's debt. I'm, I'm amazed at how corrupt the mortgage business is. Um, I'm going to talk about somebody on my PNC class. Right? We're going to talk about title insurance. I hate title insurance. It's a scam. If any of our families work in title insurance, I'm sorry, but it's a scam. Because when you refinance, you have to get new title insurance, which makes no economic sense. All right. You do have to pay points 
And that can be some. So I had to do a six hundred thousand dollar debt, and the bank charges eighteen thousand bucks, including title insurance and other things. We had to get a new survey, which was a waste of money. We had to get a an appraisal. And the, the appraisal was laughable, but uh, we had to get an appraisal that was. But yeah, so they charge fees. Technically, it's free, but they have the bank, banks know how to make money adding zero value, and that's what they do. So yeah, it can cost you some money. So a $600,000 loan, 18,000 bucks, that's a lot of money. Uh, so you have to take that in consideration. Um, but it's a complex strategy because you have this thing of an option. You're giving someone an option, and when you give them an option, you don't really know what the bond's gonna do. It, kind of, it depends on what interest rates do. And there are some people that aren't paying attention, so they may have an 8% mortgage and rates are 4%, and they don't do anything. Or maybe they can't refinance because their finances are in such bad shape. You know, who knows what's what's going on with some people. So uh, it's a very complicated bond. These are complicated bonds when you throw out these kind of options. Um, so option prices are very sensitive to volatility. And you're selling when a, the lender, I gotta make sure I'm talking about the lender or the borrower. So the bank, when they loan money, they're selling the option. When you're buying an option, you love volatility. When, when you're selling an option, you hate volatility. These type of embedded option bonds hate volatile interest rates. All right, always keep that in mind. You do not want to do mortgage-related securities if you're expecting volatility. They're great when everything's nice and tame, but when interest rates are volatile, these are horrible bonds. So what kind of bonds have these options? Convertible bonds, we're gonna ignore convertible bonds. You can make convertible bonds your entire career. Very, very complicated. So these are bonds that you can convert into stocks later. Very complicated bonds. Uh, if you're interested in them, you could certainly make not just a career in convertible bonds, but there's, there's convertible bond arb arbitrage, which is a hedge fund strategy where you could become an expert so your whole career could just be that. I'm not an expert in those bonds. They're very complicated. Callable bonds is what corporations do. So if Walmart borrows a billion dollars for 10 years, they may have the right after two years to pay that off early. When are they going to do it? When it's in their benefit. They're not going to do it. They say, you know what? We borrowed at 4%, rates are 6%. But let's, let's help out our lender. Let's pay it off and borrow again at 6%, you know, we just gotta be, no, IBM is gonna do what? What's in their best interest. They don't care about who are loaned them the money. So call bonds here, you know, Josh, to your point, they do usually have to pay a premium. So they can't pay off the debt at a billion, they have to pay off the debt at a billion, 20 million. They have to pay a 2% penalty for paying off early. There may be a lockout period, so you can't pay off for two years. So they're not as flexible as your, your mortgage, but, they do that. Um, so there's some important terms here. You're not going to learn all of this because this is really complicated stuff. But if you do the CFA exam, CFA exam part two covers all of this stuff. So let's talk some terms here. Anybody know what YTM is? Year to maturity. Does anybody know what YTW is? Yield to, all right, so YTW is yield to worst. What yield to worst does is a call of a bond. It looks at all the call dates. It assumes they pay off early on that call date and they do all the scenarios. Yield to worst is the worst case scenario of all of those. So that's something else you could Google. It's the measure of the lowest possible yield if it was paid off early. So what they pay off in two years. In two years, they got to pay a 2% premium. But they pay out in three years, they only have to pay a 1% premium. If they pay off in five years, they get to pay it off at par. What's the yield of worse, depending on what they would do? Yield of worse is in the worst interest of the lender and the best interest of the borrower. So what's the borrower last, most likely to do? The yield of worse. They're going to do what's in their best interest. All right. So yield of worse. Pretty, pretty cool concept. Here's Investopedia, here's Wikipedia. You'll probably see the word callable in there. Callable bonds. 
So yieldable maturity is of, hey, they don't do anything. They just keep paying as is, but you know they're gonna pay off early if it's in their best interest. So yield the worst is the more likely scenario for you as an investor, if you're trying to figure out what this bond's gonna do. You said it's, it is yield to the worst is the worst for a lender? For the lender, yeah. It's gonna be the lowest yield possible. So if they if they just pay off the bond as is, you get 6%, but the, hey, if they pay it off early in three years, you're only gonna get 5.2%. And that's what they're likely to do because they're better off doing it that way. So you can see some pretty good, pretty good uh, links there. So yeah, yield, yield to maturity, yield to worse. There's other terms like that that are, but those are the two most important ones: yield to maturity and yield, yield to worse. So that's a callable bond. We're not going to talk too much about callable bonds. Our focus is going to be on mortgage-backed securities because that's the biggest asset, asset class out there that applies in this area. In fact, it's been a few years since I've looked at it, but the major bond indices, the Merrill Lynch and the Barclays, I'm well, not Merrill Lynch, it's, uh, boy, who's left? Lehman, yeah, Merrill Lynch and Barclays. If you look at their aggregate bond index, last time I looked, it was like 30% treasuries and 40% mortgage-backed securities. It was only 30% corporate bonds. It was dominated by treasuries and mortgage-backed. So mortgage is a like big asset class. So... Mortgage backs, also known as MBS, mortgage backed securities. It's a type of asset backed security. Have you ever heard that term before? ABS. So in an interview, you don't say asset backed security, you say ABS. I was looking at ABS deal today of Bloomberg, kind of interesting. That would be pretty impressive. So, what is asset backed security? So, you got this bank, let's say Frost loans money on 30 year mortgages. Frost doesn't want 30 year mortgages. That's a horrible asset for Frost. So what's Frost gonna do? They're gonna take all their mortgages and they're gonna go out and create a trust. We're gonna stick all those mortgages in the trust. And that trust is gonna go out and borrow money against those mortgages and send all that money to Frost. Essentially the trust is gonna look at the present value of all those mortgages and they're gonna give that money to Frost by borrowing from the markets. And then that trust is gonna tell the market we're just gonna pass through whatever mortgage payments Frost gets. So if someone pays their mortgage as is, you'll get the principal interest from that person. If they prepay their mortgage, you're gonna get that prepayment. Whatever they do, that's the cash you're gonna do. So it's also known, you see the word in there? I don't think it's also known, they're also known as pass-through securities. So whatever the mortgagee does, that's what the borrowers get, that's what the lender is gonna get. All right, it's a mortgage pass-through. So asset-backed security is when a bank has this asset, a loan that's very illiquid. I mean, if, you're, if your neighbor borrows money from Frost and you call up Frost and say, hey, my, my neighbor just borrowed money from you. I wonder if I could buy that mortgage from you. What's Frost likely to tell you? It's like, I think you got the wrong number. We don't do that. But Frost essentially does that, but they do it by packaging many, many mortgages and selling off to the market. Do banks do this? Absolutely. USA was doing 15, 20 billion of this every single year. In fact, I remember our CEO, he was like, our bank's not growing very fast. I don't know what's the problem with our bank. And he was looking at assets. I'm, I'm sitting there knowing USA's bank at the time was maybe the fastest growing bank in the United States, but you couldn't tell because they were throwing all these assets out to the market. Their assets would have been 200, 300 billion dollars, but because they kept selling these mortgages off, they didn't grow. Uh -huh. Did you say, um they do what? I'm sorry. Did it, did it, oh, what did case go bankrupt? Did they Based on securitization? I haven't heard on securitization. You'd have to show me the article. I don't remember seeing anything like that recently. Um, the big issue in 2008 was the subprime, and a lot of the subprime were in these securities. Um, but yeah, I don't, I can't remember anything recently. If you find the article, give it to me. I, since I'm retired, I don't read as much um, Wall Street Journal stuff. Um, all right, so this is also, so this is this is called securitization. What that means is you take something that's not a security, like a mortgage, the bank sticks it into a trust and they create a security. That's securitization. What can you securitize? Well, mortgages, what else could you securitize? Sure. 
Well, we'll talk. Yeah, we'll talk to the insurance. That's kind of a special case. What about auto loans? Because they securitize those. Absolutely. USA securitizes auto loans. What about credit cards? Yeah, absolutely. They can do that. What about loans to small businesses? Absolutely. Yeah, so there's a bunch of these things out there. Someone mentioned insurance. So, yeah, we're, my insurance class is going to talk about securitizing hurricanes and earthquakes. Did you know you could securitize a hurricane? <laughs> So yeah, this the market has gotten pretty, pretty, pretty uh, sophisticated with what they can do. They've securitized all kinds of things. Um, there's some rock stars that are securitizing their royalties. So they got royalties coming in the next 50 years. They say, you know what? I want that money today. So they stick those royalties in a trust. They get their money today and the market gets whatever royalties they were gonna get. They're college students. Do you know, realize this, college students are securitizing their future earnings. Have you all heard this? So instead of borrowing money for college, they say, you know what? I'll, I'll sell you 20% of my future earnings. And I'll get that today. They pay for college. And then what have they earned? 20% of that goes to the investor. You haven't heard that? Yeah, that'd be pretty wild, right? And you have to ask, what about what's their incentive now? They just got 20% of income today. Are they going to work hard and try to but I mean, that's people are doing some wild things. So in 2008, this was known as shadow banking because it looked like Frost was loaning money out. But Frost was like the middleman here. They were like loaning money out, but then they were sending it out to the, the capital markets. Take my PNC class. Camille will explain it to you on, on next Monday. So, so yeah, it's a lot. It's it's. It's more on the liability side than the asset side, but essentially, yeah, you have to keep. But uh, you can look it up. Uh, the inventor of the hurricane securitization is USAA. They're, they did the first, it's called catastrophe bonds. You can look at catastrophe bonds and see what it is. It's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, security. It's one of the few securities I had a positive return in 08, so it can be kind of a diversifier. Yeah, securitization is a good term. Asset-backed security, securitization, essentially the same thing. Pass-through securities, essentially the same thing. So remember in finance, jargon is we have one term that means seven things, and we have seven terms that all mean the same thing. And you just have to kind of get used to that. So here's one place where you have a lot of terms that all mean the same things. Asset-backed securities, securitization, pass-through securities, shadow banking, that's all part of this, this thing type of thing. In 2008, it was mainly the subprime mortgages that were the issue. Um, it can get interesting. A lot of people think in a recession, it's the credit card loans that are a problem. But um, what people discovered in 08, that the housing market was so so messed up. Most people, they'll pay their mortgage no matter what, they'll let their credit card decline. But people were like so hopelessly behind on the mortgages, they were starting to let their mortgages go and they were paying their credit cards. So we had some strange, Strange things that weren't normal. Um, you can securitize uh, commercial mortgages as well. That's called CMBS, commercial mortgage-backed securities. So there's a lot of things you can do here. Um, so mortgage-backed securities is they have very low and actually negative convexity. We showed last week that a long treasury has a convexity of like 900. A mortgage-backed security might have convexity of negative 200, 300. For a memory convexity, so that convex shape with a mortgage, you're going to see it going below, below the line. They have actually have negative convexity, which means these are terrible in, in uh, investments for the investor. When interest rates fall, they don't make as much money as if they bought a bond without that option. All right. So when interest rates fall, the borrowers refinance, and that poor investor is getting their money back when they don't want it. Interest rates fell, you get all your money back. What are you going to do? You have to reinvest at a lower rate. You wish that person kept paying at six, but instead they paid off early. Now you got to reinvest at four. That's not good for you. When rates rise, what borrowers do is they say, you know what? I was kicking an extra 200 bucks. Like right now, my, my church is kicking an extra 4,000 bucks a month. We want to get this mortgage paid off as fast as possible. But if interest rates were to shoot up to 12%, we'd probably say, you know what? Take that 4,000. We'll just stick it in CDs. We'll make the difference. Um, so what happens when rates rise, people stop making those extra payments. So what happens is duration falls a lot when you don't want it to, 
and it rises when you don't want it to. And these bonds can really, really crush you. Mark's back securities don't have a lot of credit risk. If you think about Ginny Mays, Ginny Mays is full faith and credit in U.S. government. So if you have a Ginny May bond, you're not worried about credit risk. Your entire risk is this interest rate risk. And that brings up another term. Did any of y'all look up option adjusted spread? OAS. If you talk about OAS in, a, in an interview, they'll be they'll probably pass out. That's not an undergraduate student term. I'm not even sure John Tui's talking about it in his class. So my definition is what I learned for the CFA exam. I've seen Investopedia has a definition I think is absolutely wrong. But I'll, I'll give you my definition and then we'll see. I mean, whom do you believe, me or your or Investopedia? Well, for the exam, probably trust me. <laughs> So my definition of OAS is, so a spread is how much you make over the risk-free rate, all right? An option-adjusted spread is also a spread, but what the option-adjusted spread says, what would this bond spread be if there were no option provided? All right, so when you have one of these bonds with all this optionality, you get paid an extra spread because of the risk the person's gonna pay off early. The option adjusted spreads say, pay that extra spread out. What would this bond spread be if there was no optionality to the bond? What did you say spread was again? The spread is how much you get over the risk-free rate. So if you got a five-year bond and it's paying 5.25% and the five-year treasury is 5%, you're getting a 0.25% spread. Yeah, spread is how much you get paid. So OAS, you take the optionality and say, hey, what would this bond look like if we they couldn't prepay their mortgage? All right, that's the op That's what I say the option adjusted spread is. Let's see if Investmentpedia got it right. Option spread is the measurement of the spread of fixed income security, which is then adjusted to take into account the embedded option. That doesn't tell you much. <laughs> it's very poorly worded. Typically, they use the treasury. The spread is added to fixed income security to make for the risk-free bond. Yeah, th their definition is just terrible. The difference in yield between a bond with an embedded option with the treasuries. The difference in yield, the embedded option really included that allowed investor to issue respected FC. This is just not a de definition. All right, so there's two spreads. So let's let's do an example. Let's see if we can make, make clear this. Um, so you get a spread because you're providing the option and you get a spread just because it's a bond. I'm saying that OS is the spread you get just because it's a bond and then there's another spread because you have the option. Investopedia kind of implies that it's the extra spread you get because of the option, but option adjusted means assume there is no option, what would the spread be? So let's look at this. You have a mortgage-backed security that has a 4.5% spread. Treasuries are 4.1. So what's your spread on this bond? Total spread. 0. 0.4, 40 basis points, all right? Mm -hmm. Some of that is because it has an option. Some of that is to cover you for credit risk, all right? If this bond did not have any prepayment, it spread would have been 4.25, all right? If it had just been a normal bond, you would have gotten 425. But because it had an option to it, you got four and a half. So what is the OAS? The OAS is a 415. What you would have gotten, with, gotten without the option versus the treasury. So you're getting four, 15 basis points for OAS and you're getting another 25 basis points because you're providing that option. And that 25 basis points, the reason I use that is that what study says, when you borrow money from a bank and a mortgage, you're paying an extra 25 basis points on average to have that right to pay off your mortgage early. I mean, that, what that means, if you went to your bank and says, hey, I promise I'll never pay off this mortgage early, they should cut the rate 25 basis points. All right. So the extra 25 is what you're getting for the option. The 15 is what you're getting if there were no option. So what is that 15 paying you for? Well, credit risk, liquidity risk, whatever else there is. There's other spreads. All right. 25 for the option. So. My guess is the first time you saw that, you're like, I'm still not following it. So let's do another example. 
let's say 10 year treasury, which is what mortgages are priced off of. Let's say it's 4%. And let's say the mortgage backed security, well, I'm not going to use 4%, I'm going to use 5%, it's just so we don't. Mm -hmm. And let's say this is paying, um, make sure I have 4.4%. And let's say without the option, oh, I'm sorry, 5.4. Without the option, we'd be paying 5.1%, all right? So what is the OAS here? And I'll answer too quickly. So you're getting 40 basis points, that is the spread. The OES will always be smaller than the spread. The spread's in total amount you're getting. But if we told the borrower you cannot prepay this mortgage, what you would get on that mortgage would only be five point more. So what is the OAS here? Any guesses? How much? Point thirty. All right. We have one one saying point three. Any others? Mm -hmm. What about point one? Which of those sounds more like the OAS? 30 basis points or 10 basis points? All right, so the spread is what? Let's start with that. Spread is 40. So that's pretty straightforward. You're getting 40. What's the 30 basis points paying you for? Jalen? Say it really loud. My hearing's going. What do you mean 4.5? All right, I'm not following you out. You may have to. All right, let me give you the answer here. So, Benjamin, you gave us the spread for the option. 30 basis points that you're getting because you gave the person the option to pay off early. Yeah. That 30 basis points, you could think of that as the option premium. So you're selling the option, you're getting 30 basis points for selling an option and you're getting an additional 10 basis points, which is called the what? The OES, that is the OES. All right, now Benjamin, you may be right if Investpedia is right. <laughs> I'm right if SPD is wrong, so there's some debate here. I took CFA2 with my definition. I feel real I need to ask my friends at Victory Capital because I don't know how SPD got it got it so so different. Um, the first time I saw their definition, I was like, wait, that doesn't sound right. Now we could do we could do um, Wikipedia. It's the yield spread, which has to be added to a benchmark yield curve. That just means your spread over treasuries to discount a securities payments to match its market price using a demo pricing model that accounts for embedded options. Very ambiguous. That accounts for. What does that even more mean? My definition that says it takes out the effect, doesn't account for it. It eliminates the impact of the option. OES is Model dependent, that's true. That means 10 different models are gonna give you a different OAS because the, the key is, you know, what's, what's the volatility of interest rates in your model? The concept can be applied to mortgage-backed securities. The more or less the OAS of a security can be interpreted as the expected outperformance versus the benchmark if cash flows and yield curve have been consistent, behave consistent. They're still not telling you. OAS quantifies the yield premium using a probability. They still haven't told you. Isn't it frustrating? They won't give you the definition. All right, so I'm giving you a very precise definition. Is it because it's, it's really that difficult? You I, if I were writing Wikipedia, I would say OAS is the spread you get on a bond, assuming the option was not available. You took that option away from the borrower. That's the definition I was given. And when I was given a definition, it was really clear. So it's gotten amb ambiguous since I was in college. So I don't know why. I can't explain why they can't just 
give the def straightforward definition. Oh. It's almost like they're avoiding giving the definition, like they're not really sure is it the opposite. So, so you get a spread of 40. And this spread of 40, it's got to cover two things. One is the fact that you've given someone an option to do something. That's the option premium. And cover every all your other risk. That's the OAS. That's the 10. All right. I used to ask. So uh, Dee, Dee worked at USA. Just wonderful. I loved working with her. She, she ran USA's mortgage backed security portfolio. And guess what? She had a PhD in math. That's how complicated these bonds are. And I I love to give her questions that were just just drive her wild because she was so smart. And I would like crazy questions. So question I would ask her is, why do Ginny Mae bonds have an OAS? And why would I ask that? Well, Ginny Mae is full faith and credit of the U.S. government, so it has no credit risk, which implies it shouldn't have any OAS because it doesn't have any risk. It's very liquid. It doesn't have any credit risk. And, oh, I'd throw her into a, a pit. Yeah, but now I have a I have an opinion why Judy Mays have an OAS, which I would kind of debate with her on that. She was a lot smarter than I was, so I would have to kind of defer to her. But she ran this portfolio. She understood this stuff, but she had to have a PhD in math they will handle the math on this because it's pretty, pretty complicated stuff. Very, very complicated stuff. So Jenny May should have a zero OAS because they're really risk-free. So their entire spread is what you're getting paid because of the option that they're giving you. All right. So that was a question I'll throw out to her. But, um, you know, it's interesting. I'll show you another question I gave her that was when we talk about inflation link bonds that kind of threw her off. There's a super quick question. The MBS, that's the option. The MBS is the bond. It is assumed that you have the the option to you pay it for it. And you do, okay. right? I don't know any bank that says okay. you can't pay off your mortgage early. That's just that's just standard. If if they would if they would say you cannot pay off your mortgage early, they should give you they should give you a, a mortgage rate of four five point one. All right, y'all see that? If hey, if I went to the bank and I could not pay off my mortgage early, they should charge me 5.1. But when they give me the right to pay off the mortgage early, they're gonna pay charge me an extra 30 basis points. Now, would you go to a bank and say, hey, if I promise never to pay off early, will you give me a 30 basis points cut? Okay. Will they do that for you? No, they can't do that for you. But would you want to do that? Would any of y'all want your mortgage rate cut to 5.1? I would say. If my mortgage rate was 3%, yeah, I might be willing to do that. Yeah, I'll tell you what, 3%, I'll never pay it off early. But then the, the option premium is going to be a lot lower. This option premium is going to rise with high volatility and fall with low volume of interest rates. When interest rates are more volatile, they're going to charge you a lot more and give you to have that option to pay off early. So if interest rates are really volatile, they may charge you 5.6% because they know there's a higher probability you're going to pay off early. If interest rates are really stable, maybe your rate's only 5.3 because things are really, really stable. All right. And though this is complicated, you're going to have to do your, but this is the hardest part of exam one, question one. Um, uh -huh. Essentially, you're selling a call option on interest rates, right? And that call option, call options, if interest rates get more volatile, it's going to go up. I mean, it's going to go down in price. You're, you're going to lose money as, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, if interest rates become more volatile, the call option gets more valuable. Your bond is going to go down in value. That's going to hurt you. Yeah, I know it's complicated. you got to let it set in. So I got bad news. It's complicated. I got good news. It's complicated. Guess what they pay you for in finance? I, I hate finance classes on CAPM. We're going to see in CAPM risk free rate plus beta times market risk premium. I don't know how many exams where the professor gave me those three numbers and asked me to plug them into the, into the formula. I could have done that in second grade. How much are they going to pay you to do something you could have done in second grade? What do you do in practice? No one gives you those numbers. You got to figure them all out. That's what you got to do on paper three. You got to figure out. 
So that's what we do in finance and college. We give you all the hard stuff and ask you to calculate the easy stuff. You got to do the hard stuff because that's what they pay you for. So this is like a difficult part of finance. It's very, very mathematical. So if I wanted to get in this field, I'd probably do like DD. I wouldn't get a master's in finance. I'd probably do applied mathematics in my master's degree because this is very quantitative. Interest rate theory is very quantitative, very, very difficult stuff. So, all right. So that's the idea there. So let's. So remember to find, the find is what we just did, a pretty complicated definition. Um, what are the subcategories? Bonds with positive convexity, those that don't have any embedded options, and bonds with negative convexity or very low convexity because they provide options. All right, so here's where it gets, here's where it gets complicated. Again, the strategy. If you expect interest rates to become more volatile, you do not want a mortgage-backed security. If rates are real stable right now and you think they can get more volatile, the last thing you want is a mortgage-backed security. If rates are really volatile right now and you expect them to get more stable, it'd be a great time to buy mortgage-backed securities. They're going to do wonderful. All right? So now, if you want to sound like a genius in an interview, if you expect rates to become more volatile, you want to buy convexity. What does that mean? Buy convexity just means you want bonds with high positive convexity. You just want to buy treasuries or corporates that don't have prepayment ability. That's what buy convexity means. So if you're expecting higher volatility, you do not want mortgage-backed securities. They're going to mess up pretty badly. If you expect interest rates to become more stable, then you want to sell convexity. Now that's kind of tricky. You're not actually selling anything. By sell convexity, what the market means is you buy mortgage-backed securities. All right, you're buying bonds with negative convexity. But why? This is really, really important. Why would you do that? So I'll tell you right now, if this bond had a 5% yield and the 10 year was 5%, you would never buy the mortgage-backed security. Just buy the treasury. There's no reason to buy this. Why would you buy this bond? You get that extra 30 basis points, right, for the option. So why would you buy this bond if you expect rates gets more stable? Because they give you that higher starting yield. You get an extra 30 basis points because of that option you provided. And if you sell that option and rates get really stable, you're going to be really happy you sold that option because you're going to get to keep that all that premium, all that extra 30 basis points. So that's really important to the answer. If the two bonds have the exact time yield, you always buy the non-callable bond. There's no reason to buy a callable or prepayable bond if it doesn't provide you an extra yield. Uh -huh. Which strategy would you use in the credit? Well, there's a little more going on here because you have to think about most people have already refinanced. And so it's a little bit trickier market right now. Interest rates have been pretty volatile lately. Um, so that... Option premium, not the OES, but the option premium is probably a little wider than normal. Um, everybody's trying to figure out the Fed. So right now it's a little dangerous because the Fed is probably going to cause more volatility. But if the Fed gets really, really clear and we know exactly what we can do, interest rates will get stable. So it's you know it's kind of your your guess on what's, you know, what the Fed's going to do. So it's very Fed dependent right now. What I don't know is how much extra spreads you're getting because I haven't looked at the current yield. So you may be getting paid a lot. You might be worth it. Maybe you're getting, you know, if the normal extra rate you got to pay for the option is 25 basis points. Maybe you're getting 60 today. And you might say, wow, that's really worth it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it. If you go on Bloomberg, Bloomberg has pricing models where you can, you can test and see if you're getting a good extra yield. So, all right, pretty complex stuff. How important is this? So I'll give you my story, just I probably have nightmares tonight telling you a story because it was a pretty rough part of my career. My entire knowledge of this is academic. It's studying for the CFA exam and textbooks. So when I was at USA, USA had 70% of their bonds and mortgage-backed securities. And I was in a department that was going to make recommendations. They created this department and said, look at all of USA's assets and come back for recommendations. Guess what my recommendation was? We we're at 70%. What did I recommend? Zero. 
I recommended zero and the president investment company went crazy mad. So crazy mad, he wrote a letter to the USA board of directors talking about what an idiot I was. All right. And you don't want that as an analyst, low level analyst. You want the USA board getting a letter, how stupid you are. So he's like, his argument was these bonds do great when interest rates become more volatile. He was saying the exact opposite of what I learned. I, and he said, this kid, he's all academic. He's never traded a bond, which is absolutely true. I bought one treasury in my life. That was it. Um, so my boss, who didn't know anything about bonds, he said, Ron, this is all on you. I didn't say anything. You're the one who recommended it. So he was, I was thinking, he was going to throw me under the bus. He mm-hmm. was like, say, yeah, this idiot, he's the one who recommended it. So he told me to write a letter to the board. So I wrote a letter to the board. So now it's between me, a peon, I was just an analyst, and the president of the investment company. And who do you think won that argument? Well, I retired in 09, not in 95. So obviously I won the argument. How did I win the argument? I was lucky. They had just hired a new board member who knew this stuff backwards and forwards. I saw him coming to my department. His face was bright red. He was furiously mad. So I'm asking myself what? Who is he mad at, right? And who was he mad at? He was mad at the president of the investment company. He came to me, he says, I can't believe y'all got $25 billion in mortgage backs with his knowledge of this market. He was furiously mad. He says, this guy doesn't have a clue what he's doing. I mean, it was, I'm sitting there hearing this, y'all getting this inside information. He was furiously mad about that. And so USA sold 20 something billion in mortgage backs based on my textbook knowledge of this. So when people tell you textbook knowledge is not important, it's pretty important. You got to understand this stuff. I had textbook knowledge. I was competing with a guy whose entire training was before mortgages were created. He was in the old school. He said, wow, that four and a half percent looks really, really good. Or five. He saw this highly rated bond, which is really good spread. So these are great bonds. What was he missing? He was missing the fact that these bonds do really bad if interest rates get volatile. So, um, so we sold all our mortgage backs. Three years later, the ratings, they started downgrading any company with significant exposure to mortgage backed securities because they thought they were really dangerous bonds. And fortunately, they didn't look at USA's history and saw we had all this. So what promotion did I get out of that? Nothing. I got nothing out of that. I should have gone in and say, hey, I just saved your hides, but didn't. But don't diss these textbooks and academic academia that is pretty smart on this stuff. So I learned all this. And Dr. Misra, who was a professor here, he retired, great professor. He came to USA and taught in our entire class on mortgage-backed securities. And I, it was for the actuaries, but I sat in on it and I was fully engaged, learned a lot about it from, and he, he was really smart on this stuff. So um, if you go into a firm with a lot of mortgage-backed securities, you might find it's probably, there's probably not too many old school people left. It was the people that trained in the 60s and 70s that really didn't understand these bonds. And he was one of those people. Um, I mean, it was amazing. USA, that exposure was the life insurance actuaries. They loved me because they hated these bonds. Their models said they were horrible bonds, but they couldn't get out of them. And I, I kind of saved them on that. Um, but yeah, so what I'm showing you here, this is very academic, but it's real world too. This is the way you think about these bonds. It's pretty important stuff. So I know it's complicated, but I handled the complexity and it kind of helped, you know, in my career or could have gotten me fired one way or the other. Um, all right. Any questions on that complicated stuff? Now, tomorrow, someone says, what was this complexity stuff? Can you explain it to me? How, how many, for how many minutes will you be talking? 10 seconds, 20 minutes. So how do you learn stuff like this? Just going to look at it over and over again, space it out, read different sources. You can see Investopedia and Wikipedia are pretty ambiguous on some of this stuff. So you have to do some research. So no questions. And is it no questions because it's just too much, right? Tough stuff. So like besides the slides, well, you have to put this into your own words, but you can certainly go Google and find some other terms. I like Wikipedia, but I don't like Wikipedia or, or Investopedia on some of this stuff because I think whoever wrote it, they're just kind of avoiding just giving clear, clear, clear answers. But they're probably, I, I did put a paper, I can't remember if I did, 
the look. I do have a paper on duration and convexity that you can read as well. Okay. It's complicated stuff, but it's very, very, very valuable stuff. All right, don't leave yet because we still got a few minutes. Um, all right, so where do we go next? So we go to the next C. So DC cuts I, who's got it now? Duration. Duration that's worried about. No, duration is worried about the direction of interest rates. And the next one is convexity. It's worried about the volatility of interest rates. And what comes next? Credit. There you're worried about the economy, if we're going to be strong recession or not. The U, U.S. versus non-U.S. There you're all concerned about currencies. The T, taxes, not Texas, taxes. The S. Structure. structure. We just talked about structure. Mortgage-backed securities are structured debt, but we're going to go a little more into it. And then the S, I mean, the I, inflation. inflation. All right. So that's why I have left. So we're going to get into credit next. Credit's a little more straightforward. So credit is the risk that you loan someone money and they can't pay you back because they're bankrupt. All right. Now with credit, there's a couple things here. It's, it's their ability to pay, but also credit's really, really important. What industry or sector you, you are in. So in 2020, people are really worried about the energy sector because oil prices fell so much. A lot of these fracking companies in Texas were like, hey, oil prices are back to 20 bucks. We can't compete with that. Um, so what industry? And then after COVID, there are people worried about the consumer's discretionary, you know, airlines and and uh, cruise lines. So you have to think about the sector today, um, you know, what particular sector people are worried about, you know, it, it changes every all the time. Um, the credit related risk of default is you have some contractual uh, cash flow and that doesn't make, doesn't work. You can look at the definitions and the notes of Credit, I think I may have in here, we'll see. Yeah, so we'll, we'll look at some of the definitions. So what are the subcategories? So the definition is just the probability someone's not gonna pay you back because of some default problem. So the categories are high quality, medium quality, and low quality, all right? High quality is governments, triple A's, double A's, and single A's. Medium quality or triple B's. And low quality has a bunch of names. What names do y'all know for low quality? Uh, I, I, high, high yield, yield, junk bonds, the low investment grade bonds. So high yield, they're below investment grade bonds, but the people who manage the money, they like to say high yield because high yield sounds a lot better than junk bonds. So they like that term high yield. Uh, so those are the three categories. We use S&P and Moody's, two entities I worked a lot with. You can have a job in these two entities. A good friend of mine worked at S&P and it was really amazing to me how manual and kind of unautomated S&P is. Y'all know where S&P is located? Their main office? Have any of y'all seen a massive bull sitting in the street? In New York City, yeah, that's, that's the S&P bull right in front of their offices. So here's the category. So Government or sovereign, that's the highest quality. Why? Because they can print their own money. If you can print your own money, you're, it's, it can be kind of stupid if you don't pay off your debt. Right? If you had a printing press in your basement, you should be able to pay off all your debt as long as you can print fast enough. Then AAA, there aren't too many AAAs left. I think Microsoft still, maybe Berkshire have, I can't remember. There's not many left. USA used to be AAA, but they're not anymore. Double A is still a very high rating today. Single A is still a very high rating. Moody's has a capital A and a small a. All the others is two capitals. Moody's uses a one, two, and three. So double A one, double A two, double A three. S&P just uses plus signs and minus signs. And then medium quality or triple Bs, S&P is all capital Bs, B, 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 plus, no plus and a minus. Moody's is B double A. You might hear it called B double A. But B double A and triple B are the same and they have a one, two, and a three. I would know these credit ratings, just know the difference between the two of them. Recognize Moody's, recognize SP. And then junk is everything below triple B. So double B, single B, 
triple C, double C, single C, and then D is easy because D for default. D means when you have a default, that means they miss a scheduled payment. Could be interest, could be principal, but they missed a the scheduled payment, which has been the big debate with the U.S. Treasury because they're debating the, the debt ceiling. If the U.S. government doesn't pay its debt because of the debt ceiling, they're technically in default. So they, they could be. So the bonds that are lowest quality have the widest spreads. And the highest quality ones have the narrowest spreads. And those are the words you use, wide and narrow. Remember on duration, it's length and duration, short and duration. On spread, it's widespread and narrow spread. I don't know who came up with those words, but those are the words. So these junk bonds are also known as hybrid securities because they look a lot like stocks in certain times and look like bonds in certain times. So they're kind of a hybrid between stocks and bonds. In 2009, when the stock market came back 70%, high yield was up 70% as well. It looked a lot more like a stock than it looked like a bond. And when things sell off, they sell off a bunch. So they, they're probably a little more highly correlated to stocks than they are to bonds. So, and then preferred stocks are also hybrid security. They're kind of, it kind of depends. Preferred stocks can be high quality or low quality as well, just depending. All right, so we got, we got the categories. So we'll next class get in the credit a little bit more. All right, I'll stop it there.